dedicated to the strength of the nation. Proudly, we hail. Yes, proudly we hail, starring Lon McAllister in Forever Always, the United States Army and United States Air Force presentation. And now here is our producer, the well-known Hollywood showman, C.P. McGregor. Thank you, thank you very much, and greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to your theater of stars. For all your Hollywood screen favorites, come to join us in plays we know you'll enjoy. Lon McAllister makes a command return appearance before our microphone and stars in a dramatic romance titled Forever Always. We'll have the curtain for Act One in just a moment, but first, here is your announcer with a message of importance. You can be a key man on the U.S. Air Force team as a navigator. Learn about the U.S. Air Force's new navigator training course at Ellington Air Force Base in Texas. Applicants must be between the ages of 20 and 26 and one half and be able to meet certain educational and physical standards. Look into this opportunity for a future as a navigator, as a flying executive aboard the mighty bombers and transports of the U.S. Air Force. Plan now to consider this program. Visit your nearest U.S. Army and U.S. Air Force recruiting station today. Now, once again, our producer. The curtain rises on Act One of Forever Always, starring Lon McAllister as Larry Aldridge. This is a story of simplicity. It's a story of a boy and a girl, just that. The story begins, like all stories do, in a town. It could be any town. It could be your town, if your town isn't very big. But on second thought, what towns are? This town of ours, yours and mine, well, it only has a population of 2,000. It has a Rotary Club, Kiwanis, Odd fellows, you know, like any good town. It has a public library, too. We got it by public subscription. It has three churches where mostly God-fearing people. Oh, I almost forgot the Chamber of Commerce. Naturally, we have one of those. Oh, my gosh, look what time it is. 3.30, school's letting out. I'd better get home or my wife will skin me. Jennifer! Larry! Hey, Jennifer, wait on a minute. I'll walk home with you. All right, Larry. Gee, I thought old Miss Badger was going to keep me in again. She saw me passing a note to Chris. Yeah, you want me to carry your books? If you want to. Sure I do. Hey, let's take that shortcut to the pasture. I, I know where there's a quail's nest. Oh, I can't stop, Larry. I told Mom I'd be home right after school. She's not feeling very well. Oh, gee, I'm sorry. Hey, wait a minute, Jennifer. I'll, I'll hold the fence wire so you won't tell your address. Oh. There. Thank you. Your mom's been sick an awful lot this year, hasn't she? Uh-huh. At supper last night, my mom was saying what a job it puts on your shoulders. I mean, going to school and everything. Oh, I don't mind it much, Larry. Except the kids won't pay any attention to me like they do to mom. Well, whale them. Oh, they're too little. Jennifer. Hmm? Jen, do you believe all that stuff in geography? All what stuff? Oh, you know, like, like all those foreign places Miss Badgley talks about. Baghdad and the, and the Taj Mahal and Venice and the pyramids in Egypt. Things like that. Do you think they're really there, Jennifer? Oh, sure I do. It says so in the book, doesn't it? Well, yeah, I guess it does, but... Well, it's sort of hard to imagine all those places. According to Miss Badgley, they're older than Grand Bailey. <laughs> well, they are older than she is. Well, Grand sell. Bailey's pretty old. Jennifer, hmm? we're, uh, we're still engaged, aren't we? Mm-hmm. You haven't changed your mind about us getting married when we're grown up, have you? Mm-mm. Not unless you have. Oh, of course I haven't. Jennifer, when we get married, let's get on a boat and go to all those places Miss Badgley talks about. Would you like to? Oh, sure I would, I guess. Gee, can you imagine you and me standing on top of a big old pyramid? <laughs> Miss Badgley'd have a fit. <laughs> Jennifer, hmm? do you believe that Frenchmen eat snails? Ooh. Oh, we won't eat them, though, when we're in Paris. Oh, no, I couldn't do it. Oh, me neither. Make me sick. Oh, me too. 
Here's my lane, Larry. I've got to go now. Yeah. Here, here, here are your books. Thanks. Jennifer, you won't forget about all those places, will you? I mean, when we get married? Mm -mm. Will you make our secret promise on it? Mm -hmm. All right, then. Crook your little finger around mine. Now, ready? Oh. Through, Through good, good days, days and bad, and bad days, days, I, I promise, promise you. Forever, forever always. always. Bye, Jennifer. Bye, Larry. Well, almost four springs have come and gone since Jennifer and Larry made their secret promise forever always. Larry has grown like a weed, one of the garden variety, and Jennifer is as pretty as a sunbeam in a buttercup. She's a little thin, though. She's been working hard taking care of her mom and the kids. She's a fine girl, Jennifer. Well, sir, it's another spring night here in this town of ours. The man in the moon has lit his lantern in the sky. The crickets are playing their fiddles, and the frogs have joined in their double bass viols. Larry and Jennifer are sitting on the riverbank in the moss and dabbling their fingers in the water as it goes whispering down to somewhere. Larry. Hmm? What are you thinking about? Oh, I don't know. You mad at me? No. I'm sorry about the Sunday school picnic, Larry. I want more than anything to go with you, but you know how it is with Mom. Yeah. Oh, don't say it in that tone of voice, Larry. Well, gee, Jennifer, it was the same thing at the Christmas party and at Bob Coleman's birthday party. Why can't the kids stay home with your mom once in a while? You know why, Larry. They're too little. They don't know how to do things for Mom like I do. Yeah. Larry. Hmm? Larry, why don't you take somebody else to the picnic? Because I want to take you. We're engaged, remember? I know, but... Oh, I don't want you to stay home just because of me, Larry. You haven't been anywhere. Neither of you, Jennifer. Well, that's different. Look, I understand about your mom, and I don't care about going places. I can wait until the kids are older, and then when we're married, well, we'll make it all up, huh? Mm-hmm. We'll get on a boat, and we'll sail and sail. And we'll see the Taj Mahal and Moonlight. And the marketplace in Baghdad. And we'll stand on top of a pyramid and think of Miss Badgley. Won't we, Larry? <laughs> sure. You want to promise? Uh-huh. Give me a little finger. You ready? I love you, Larry. I love you, too, Jennifer. Well, sir, that's just about the way things went on for another four or five springs and summers and autumns and winters. The seasons come and go in our town just about the same way and at the same time as anywhere else. Larry and Jennifer are still just about the same, not going anywhere because of Mom and the kids and everybody taking it for granted. Well, it's autumn now, and the leaves are making a Joseph's coat in the woods, and the sun is pouring down like honey and the apple dumpling of the world. Larry and Jennifer are driving home from the market in a horse and buggy, the mare wagging her ears and not paying attention to anything. Maybe just thinking, if little mares do think. Winter's going to be light this year, Larry. Jennifer. Hmm? Jennifer, your kid sister's 17 now, isn't she? Yes, Larry. Well, always before, it's been that the kids were too little to look after your mom. Lucy's 17 now. Yes, but you know how fussy mom is about things, Larry. Well, it's about time she learned to be unfussy about things. And oh. don't look at me like that. I know she's your mother and you love her, but that doesn't mean you've got to sacrifice your whole life, does it? And mine, too. Larry. Well, somebody's got to talk plain facts, Jennifer. We can't go on like this forever with mom this and mom that. I'm asking you for the last time. Will you marry me? But don't you understand, Larry? I understand all I need to understand. I want a simple answer. Yes or no? Well? All right, Larry. Yes. Whoa, hold up. Whoa. Okay, Jennifer, when? Whenever you say, Larry. I guess you've waited long enough. All right, a week from Sunday. I've got a week's holiday coming then, and that'll be the best time to take it. What do you say? Well, it's a little soon, but I think I can manage, Larry. Bless you, darling. You're wonderful. Uh, you know something, Larry? What? It's the very first time you ever called me, darling. Well, sir, a person might say Larry just plumb grabbed the bull by the horns. 
And I'd say it was about time, too. Of course, when the news got out, there was quite a commotion here in our town. And then, of course, Sunday came around like most Sundays do. Larry looking somewhat glassy-eyed in his new suit and haircut. The preacher was there, beaming like preachers do at such goings-on. Everything was all ready. And then, wouldn't you know it, Mom took sick. Some sort of a spell. And to call Dr. Ainsley. He's been in with her now for about an hour. And Larry, well, Larry is standing propped up by the mantel, and he sure looks glum. Can't blame him much, I guess. How is she, Doctor? Is she going to be all right? Well, Larry, I think maybe you'd better go into Jennifer. She's kneeling by the bedside. She can't cry, Larry. What? I'm very sorry, my boy, but... I guess the excitement was a little too much. Jennifer's mother died five minutes ago. You better go in. Yes, I... I guess so. Jennifer. She... She apologized, Larry. She said to tell you that she was sorry for dying at a time like this, but she couldn't help it. Don't, Jennifer. I'm sorry, too, Larry. With all my heart, I am. Forever and always is such a very long time, isn't it? We pause briefly for my story, Forever Always, starring Lon McAllister to bring you an important message from your government. America's finest men choose U.S. Army careers. For the well-qualified young men with an eye to the future, here is the career opportunity of a lifetime. The United States Army now extends an invitation to high school graduates to begin important new careers in professional service. Choose your branch of service from these five. Infantry, field artillery, armored cavalry, Corps of Engineers, or anti-aircraft artillery. And once you're in... Army Career Guidance goes to work for you, fitting you in the right job, helping you become more skilled, training you for advancement. Visit your nearest U.S. Army and U.S. Air Force recruiting office at once for full career details. Your recruiting sergeant can give you a complete picture of peacetime Army life. Ask about the many personal benefits regular soldiers receive. Job security, retirement, advanced training, unequaled sports, travel, and recreation and 30 days paid vacation every year. It's your career. Make it an Army career. America's finest men choose U.S. Army careers. The curtain rises on Act Two of Forever Always, starring Lon McAllister as Larry. Well, sir... It sure looks like Providence was dead set against those two kids, Jennifer and Larry, ever getting hitched in double harness. Most of us here in the town were pretty sorry about Mrs. Hallett being called home by the Almighty. Well, time heals the scar, they say. A little while ago, Larry walked Jennifer home from church. It's Sunday night, and they're sitting in the kitchen now. What would you think of the sermon tonight, Larry? Oh, it was good enough as sermons go, I guess. Nice thought. Why, Larry Aldrich, what an awful thing to say. That's almost blasphemy. Well, maybe, but it's pretty easy to stand up in front of a congregation and talk about faith moving mountains. But who wants to move a mountain? Larry doesn't mean that literally. Well, if it did, all the faith I've had in our marriage would move the Andes to the Sahara Desert and back again. But there's still no wedding ring on your finger. Faith without works is dead, Larry. Works? Jumping Jehoshaphat, Jennifer. Ever since I was knee-high to a grasshopper, I've been working at nothing else. I suppose now you're going to quote me, everything comes to he who waits. How many times have I told you to stir your coffee and not use so much sugar, hmm? Mm. At this rate, we'll both be grayer than Toby's tabby before it does. I know, Larry, and you've been wonderful about everything. But won't you be patient just a little longer? A Lucy will be married next month, and then there'll be nothing to stand in our way. No, not unless the church falls down or I turn into a lunatic. You can't get married if you're crazy. 
Such talk as that makes me wonder if you're not crazy. And I've already put salt on that sandwich. Do you want to get hardening of the arteries? First, we couldn't get married because your mom was too sick. And when she went, you had to take care of the kids. Larry. And now it's Lucy. You've got to see her get married oh, first. Poor Larry. You cook your little finger around mine. Well... Go on now. And just as soon as Lucy's married, I give you my solemn word. We'll take our vows for bad days and good days. Come on, Larry, say it. Through good, good days, days and, and bad, bad days, days, I, I promise, promise forever, forever always. always. Now you can have another cup of coffee, if you'll promise not to use so much sugar. Well, sir, Lucy got married to a right nice young man, Tom Williams' boy. It was a pretty wedding, too. All except for Miss Greeley falling off the organ stool like she did during the wedding march. She said she was dizzy. Well, it looks like there isn't anything now to come between Jennifer and Larry saying, I do. It's Monday morning now, and there's quite a hubbub down at the bank on Tanner Street. Hey, what's going on? Yeah, well, didn't you hear? It's a run on the bank. Well, when did it start? Let me through. Let me through. Well, the bank's gone bust, Miss Hallett. The constables just went in. Oh, let me in. Let me in, please. Bank's closed, Miss Hallett. May I come in, please? I want to see Larry, Mr. Aldrich. Well, it's against orders, but I reckon he'd like to see you too, Miss Hallett. Come in. Thank you. Where is Larry? He's in the office, Miss Hallett. I'll show you the way. Here, Miss Hallett. Thanks. Larry. Jennifer. What is it, Larry? I saw all the commotion. I thought there was a holdup or something. What's happened? Well, this gentleman just put me under arrest, Jennifer. Under arrest? What in the world for? I think they call it embezzlement. Embezzle? Larry. I know, it sounds pretty awful, doesn't it? But you didn't. No, of course I didn't, but I'm responsible for the accounts and there's $65,000 missing. The examiners were here all day yesterday. But didn't you know? I mean, didn't you know that something was wrong with the account? Yes, of course I knew, but that's why I call the examiners. That's why they came yesterday. I've known that something was wrong for a long time. I, I've been worrying about it. Larry, why haven't you said something? Well, I... You shouldn't worry alone, Larry. Well, you've had enough to worry about, honey. What with everything happening the way it has? I thought that maybe if the examiners came, they could straighten the mess out. And now... Larry, now... And now the vice president, Cyrus Griffith, has preferred charges against me. He thinks I'm a thief. Oh, no, Larry. I'm afraid it's yes. You see, they've even handcuffed me like a thief. Not just a common thief, either. What they think I did, they call grand larceny. The prisoner will rise and face the bench. Larry Moore Aldridge, you have been tried and found guilty of grand larceny in the section of embezzlement. Where the evidence and testimonies against you have been of a circumstantial nature, your defense and rebuttal have not been sufficient to refute or weigh the scales in your favor. However, in view of your immaculate record, this court feels moved to accept a recommendation for leniency. <clears throat> Have you anything to say to this court before I pronounce sentence? No, Your Honor. I said everything there was to say in the two words of my plea. Not guilty. Larry Moore Aldrich, I hereby sentence you to a period of not more than ten years or less than five years in the state penitentiary at Falmouth. Such sentence to begin upon your delivery by the sheriff to the said penal institution. <laughs> Well, Jennifer, I, I guess this is the end. The end, Larry? The end of what? Don't pretend you don't know. I don't have to pretend, Larry. I don't know. You mean the end of us? Do you mean the end of our forever always? Isn't it? There's an end to everything, isn't there? There's got to be an end to forever always, hasn't there? No, Larry, there hasn't. Not only hasn't, but can't be. There's no end to the sky, is there? There's no end to the beyond. And wherever there is an end, there's always something on the other side of it. And that something, Larry, is the always. Jennifer, the end that you just spoke of for me, 
are the prison walls at Falmouth Penitentiary. Beyond them is where I'm going. Not for long, Larry. You see, my dear, I know you didn't steal that money. As sure as I know that the sun will rise tomorrow morning, I know that there's been a dreadful mistake made. And I'm going to find it. And then, Larry, there will be another beyond. The beyond the prison walls again. And that will be our real always forever. Crook your little finger in mine, Larry. Ready. You're wonderful, Jennifer. Ready. Through, Through good, good days, days and, and bad, bad days, days. I, I love, love you forever, forever always. I love you, Larry. I love you too, Jennifer. Well, sir, talk about faith-moving mountains. For two long years, Jennifer worked, knowing in her heart that Larry was innocent. She practically turned the state upside down. And then, one day, the investigators found it. It was old Cyrus Griffith himself who had done the embezzling. Naturally, on the day they turned Larry loose, Jennifer was there, her eyes brimming over with tears. Larry, you're a free man now. Yes, I'm a free man now. Larry, I don't want to bore you with any soothing syrup, with any unctuous apologies. However, I do want to say this to you. Justice is an infallible thing. You must believe that, Larry. You mustn't blame justice for what has happened to you. You've made mistakes in your life, haven't you? Yes, of course. Then have a little tolerance for us. By us, I mean we who are the administrators of justice. We try not to make mistakes, but we're only human. And thus sometimes we do. But when we do, we try to rectify them in the best way we know how. Realize, Larry, that the laws of our land, the justice was not at fault. We were at fault. I know it's rather foolish to speak of paying for a man's loss of freedom, but the state feels deeply obligated to you, and it offers you its deep and humble apology. Will you accept this as a small token of its feelings? Five thousand dollars and our regrets. That's all I have to say, my boy. I leave you now with a far richer reward. Your Jennifer. Jennifer. Oh, Larry. That's right. <laughs> Cry, darling. It, it's all over now. I didn't mean to be a bald baby. <laughs> have a handkerchief. <laughs> sure. Here, blow. <laughs> If it hadn't been for you, Jenny... Shh. It's all over now, Larry. Try to forget it, dear. I will, my dear. And it will be forever always, won't it? Now. Of course, Larry. How soon can we be married? <laughs> Today, tomorrow, this, this very second, if you like. Crook your little finger in mine, darling. Of course, Jennifer. Well, sir, from that moment on... Larry and Jennifer dropped out of sight just like they'd never been born. None of the folks hereabouts in our town could imagine what had happened to them. There was more talk than you could shake a stick at. <laughs> you know, Larry, we ought to be ashamed of ourselves for not having written before this. <laughs> I bet the folks at home are mighty puzzled not knowing where we are. Ah, oh, but the important thing, Larry, is that we know where we are, don't we, darling? Yes, in love and in Egypt. Hey, let's see that picture postcard again. Mm -hmm. Say, you know, that's an awfully good picture of us. Who would have ever thought it? Well, we used to think it when we were kids in school. Yeah. You and me standing on top of the Great Pyramid of Cheops. And you can tell it's us, too. <laughs> I'll bet Miss Badgie will have a fit when she sees this. <laughs> we better get it off of the mail, then, hadn't we? Well, we better sign it first, don't you think? Uh -huh. Just this one last sentence. Having wonderful time, wish you were here. <laughs> How should we sign it, Larry? Well, let's see. Could there be anything better than just to say... Lovingly yours, forever always. Jennifer. And Larry. The curtain falls in the final act of Forever Always. 
Our star, Lon McAllister, will return to our microphone for a curtain call after this timely message from Wendell Niles. Planning for the future is mighty important to a young man with ability and ambition. If you're one of these fellows, look to a future as an officer in the United States Air Force, a flying career as a pilot or navigator, or a non-flying career in a wide variety of interesting fields can be yours. To qualify and be selected for training, you must meet certain age educational and physical standards. On completion of training, you'll earn your reserve commission as a second lieutenant and have many opportunities to earn a regular commission while on active duty. Here is your opportunity for a future that's exciting and challenging. Get all the facts on the important assignments awaiting you and the many other reasons why being an officer in the U.S. Air Force can mean so much to your future. Visit your nearest U.S. Army and U.S. Air Force recruiting station for complete information right away. Now, once again at the microphone, our star and our producer. Lon, it's always a pleasure to welcome you back to our microphone. That goes double, CP. I get a great kick out of doing a show with you. The last time you were here, you recall, we left a little matter up in the air as far as our audience is concerned. Oh, uh, what you mean is you invited me out to your ranch, provided I brought my paintbrushes along and provided I painted your barn. You said you had agoraphobia or something. <laughs> I just said I didn't like to work high up on a swinging platform with all that air between the ground and me. <laughs> So I came out and painted your barn. Maybe that's why you turned producer with Frank Melford out at Eagle Lion. Well, um, that and money. But say, you promised me if I'd paint your barn, you'd catch the big cat. Now, uh, did you do it? I certainly did. Preston Foster, his wife Sheila and I, went to the Century Theater that featured the big cat at its premiere opening. You, Press, and Peggy Ann Garner were wonderful. I thought that climax where you killed the wildcat with a broken rifle was a masterpiece of action. Oh, I'm glad you liked it, C.P. I hope you liked our new one, too. That's the one that uh, Frank Melford and I are producing. Uh, what's the title? Well, right now we call it The Boy from Indiana. Are you in it? <laughs> oh, sure. With a title like that, they couldn't keep me out. But in spite of that, I still think you'll like the picture. Well, C.P., I see that the time has come, so maybe you'd better brief me on the big doings here in your theater next week. Well, Lon, the big doings, as you so aptly call our show, for next week's stars, George DeLenz who is making his radio debut with us in a dramatic story, Journey to Bethany. You'll enjoy it, I'm sure. Well, I'll be on hand listening as usual. So long, C.P. Goodbye, Lon. <laughs> be sure to join us next week, ladies and gentlemen, when George DeLenz stars in a dramatic story, Journey to Bethany. Until then, thanks for listening, and cheerio from Hollywood. Ron McAllister appeared for the courtesy of the Hollywood Coordinating Committee, which arranges for the appearance of all stars in this program. The script was by Kimball S. Sant, the music of Eddie Dunsett. This program is transcribed in Hollywood for release at this time. Wendell Niles speaking. <laughs>